In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, I think that there are an awful lot of people that are really genuinely spiritually wondering why all this is happening, why is it happening now, and those questions are not unfounded. I don't think there's anything wrong with asking some of those questions, but I think that there are a lot of wrong answers and misinformation out there, or at least uninformed people that are making claims that they cannot back up. One that I have seen is that this is a direct punishment coming from God. Now, as a full disclaimer, I'm always incredibly, incredibly cautious when determining that anything is divine providence or a direct act of God's will. Now, when it comes to terrible things happening to countries, my normal response is not that God is going out of his way to directly take them down, but more that he is removing his hand of protection. And so it's more like he was sustaining a nation and just isn't for a time, rather than him actually going out and destroying people. And I think from a spiritual nature, and we're not going to dive way off into this, I think that that's kind of how punishment works with him in general. For example, when they say, how could a loving God send anybody to hell? I don't know that he actually sends people to hell as much as he just allows them to reap the benefits that they have sown. In other words, they live in a moral life. And because of that, they stay with other people who have done the same. And if you have a place that is populated only with evil people, well, then that place is going to be hell, whether it's on this side of eternity or the next. And so... It's not so much that God goes out of his way and just smacks somebody as much as it is he takes away his blessing and his his protection from them. Normally, I think that's how it spiritually works. And a lot of this comes from a lot of my understanding was really sort of shaped by a passage in the book of Lamentations. Now, to understand what's going on in the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah, who authored the book, He's not called the weeping prophet for nothing. Jeremiah has spent a large portion of his life doing all kinds of things, trying to get Israel's attention and telling them, Hey guys, just so you know, the day of judgment is coming. It is on its way, and if you don't repent and turn from your ways right now, it's going to get really, really bad. And he said this for years on end. And Israel still ignored him. He did everything that he could, even making his own life sort of a parable for Israel to help understand the seriousness of their rebellion against God. And ultimately, they refused to repent. And because of this, the book of Lamentation is a reaction to Israel's refusal to repent. And so we're going to go ahead and look in Lamentation chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And remember, this is sort of a a poetic book, and so this is written in poetic verse. So, Lamentations 2, 1 through 3. How the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger. He has cast from heaven to earth the glory of Israel and has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord swallowed up, he has not spared, All the habitations of Jacob, in his wrath has he thrown down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought them down to the ground. He has profaned the kingdom and its princes. In the fiercest anger, he has cut off all strength of Israel. He has drawn back his right hand from before the enemy, and he has burned in Jacob like a flaming fire, consuming all around him. Now, when you're looking at that passage of Scripture, there are actually uh, several things that I wanted you to bring up, uh, to, to sort of bring to your attention. 
three things in particular. You'll notice how the action taken from God is not actively against Israel. It's more like he has been holding the enemy at bay, and then all of a sudden he has decided, nope, not going to do that anymore, just going to let them do what they were going to do already. And so in that sense, God is more of a protector that leaves his post rather than a punisher or an avenger. I think that sometimes the Bible paints him in that language too, and that's wholly appropriate. But I'm saying this is one instance where it kind of talks about God doing the opposite. So three things I want you to notice in verse 1. It says that he has not remembered his footstool, and, and just so you know, Jerusalem is all, often referred to as the footstool of God, so that's symbolism they would have readily understood. So he's going to not remember them, and then you skip down to verse 3, he says he's going to cut off the strength of Israel. So that's the second instance where it's sort of God removing himself from the situation, and the third, he has drawn back his right hand. So in each of these scenarios, God is active. He is making a choice and making a decision, but that choice is not to actively punish Israel, but just to not protect them the way that he has been in the past. And I think in a lot of ways, this is reflective of Christ's ministry and how he explains it. If you look at his parables, for example, the parable of the lamb. Did the shepherd kick the lamb out, or did the lamb leave of his own accord? That lost lamb was not banished by the shepherd. The lamb decided to pursue after something that he shouldn't have and go a place where he ought not go. And then the shepherd, of course, eventually does bring him back, but ultimately it was not the shepherd who drove the lamb out of the herd. The lamb left of his own accord. The same could be said of the lost son. When you're talking about the prodigal son... You see, that son had gone and then came back. The father didn't make the son leave. The son left because he wanted to leave and he wanted his inheritance and to live a riotous, evil lifestyle. And then when it came to the rich fool, you remember the one that said, okay, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns and I'll have an even greater harvest and increase my wealth. And then God says to him, you fool this night, your soul shall be required of you. Again, this is something that it seems to be emphasizing the fact that he did all this to himself. He fell prey to his own action, not something that God was doing proactively to him. And they all center around this central idea that it is God's protection that is being removed, not so much that God is actively punishing those people. You could see this in other places, for example, the, uh, the wedding feast or the parable of the ten virgins, it's not as though the, uh, the, the people that come to the wedding feast or the virgins that come to the door, he doesn't kick them out of the wedding feast or the wedding banquet. They're just already outside and he does not let them in. That's a, there is a big difference there. Ultimately, what this means for us is we can either recognize our dependency on God or be forced to recognize it. We either can repent of our sins and choose to turn away from our evil ways, or we can be we can have this divine protection taken away from us and realize how much we needed him. It's in a lot of ways kind of like a parent. You, you know, when the kid, because when you're a kid, you think you know everything. When you're a kid, you say to your parents, no, no, I don't need your help. I have this. I can do it. I can do it on my own. I don't know how many times as a child I said, I can do it on my own when I got in way over my head. And for a while, the parent will protest. The parent will say, no, no, you don't. Let me help you out. Whether you're learning to ride a bike or do something that might hurt you, they may step in and go, no, 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 I'm going to, going to, you know, have my hand here on the back of the bike. I'm going to help you along here. And then eventually, if you keep protesting and say, no, 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 I've got it. I don't need your help. I'll be okay. Eventually, a good parent is going to say, okay, go ahead. And sometimes as a kid, you learn a hard lesson that way. Whether you wind up smashing into something on your bike because you weren't ready or, or whatever else it may be, the parent is stepping in because they understand that the child can't do this on their own, and the child defiantly says, no, no, I don't need your help. I have this. How many times do we in this country do that to God? 
whether we do it directly or indirectly, we're like, you know what, God, we don't really need your help. We don't really need to pray for this stuff. We don't really need your blessings upon us. Look at all the amazing things we've got. Now, you just heard earlier in this program that capitalism has done so much for this country. But ultimately, the only reason that it works is because we acknowledged God's presence and his working in it. I mean, that's the whole re- that's the key ingredient of this whole thing. If that goes away, everything else goes away. The reason that freedom functions at all is because people are self-governing and have a relationship with God. John Adams stated that. Somebody that was there during the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence being forged. I mean, he understood that. And our other president said similar things to him and understood that as well. That our society and our constitution and our laws and our system were all designed for a moral, religious people that took their relationship with God seriously. And once that went away, once that was no longer preeminent, well, then the system started to develop some problems. And that's what we're seeing right now. I don't want to be forced to recognize our dependency on God. I I want to, and I'm humble enough to realize I may not fully appreciate it, but I really, really want to not have to go through that. I would really rather just be grateful and recognize God's dependency on me now before I have to be taught that lesson through a very unpleasant means. But this is what happened to the British Empire in the Revolutionary War, It happened to us during the Civil War. It happened to us in World War II. It really happened to the world in World War II, where God kind of withdrew his protection and let some really horrible things happen because we had forsaken him. And it could happen again. You know how much I love this country. A big part of the reason I do this show is because of my patriotism, because I I love this country. I think that it is an exceptional place. I believe in American exceptionalism. I believe this is the greatest, most prosperous nation that has ever existed on the face of this planet. But you know what? America is not too big to fail in God's eyes. If America is destroyed, the world will go on. It survived a long time before us. It'll survive afterward. And when it comes to God, I'm not saying that the coronavirus is this, and I don't think that this is going to be the result of this, But I'm just saying, whether it's this or something else, there is no nation that is built by human hands that cannot be defeated by God. Period. End of discussion. People would have said that there was no way the Greek Empire or the Roman Empire or the British Empire would have ever fallen prey like other nations have. You could do that all the way back to Egypt, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, any of them. And they're all just pages in our history books now. There is no nation that once God has decided not to protect them anymore, that will not fall without his blessing. That's just the truth. And so we better make sure that we do everything we can to do what Abraham Lincoln suggested than make sure that we are on God's side instead of worrying whether or not God's on our side, because God's side is always the right side. And so we need to be worried about that more than we're worried about everything else. I worry about the economy. I worry about everything else too. But ultimately, if we don't do that right, if we, if we screw that up, if we don't keep the covenant with God that we have made, then it doesn't matter how strong our economy is. It doesn't matter how impervious we seem to be to the outside world. America will fall. There is no nation made by human hands that God cannot take down if he removes his protection from them. That has always been true. It is always going to be true. No nation beforehand or in the future will ever exist that that rule does not apply to. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell. 
and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.